Hey everybody, it's Miss Noble, St. Tammany Parish teacher for 7th and 8th grade. I am reading Stargirl, and we left off on Chapter 5, and at that point, Stargirl was at a football game, and she kind of made um, a little appearance, which made everybody else want to come out to the next football game, and then she didn't show up. But then the next day at school, she went and tried out for cheerleading, and things are starting to turn around. Uh, more people were being Stargirl's friends. So now we're into chapter six. Hillary herself set the stage the day before. In the middle of lunch, she got up from her table and walked over to Stargirl. For half a minute, she just stood behind Stargirl's chair. Silence everywhere, except for tinklings in the kitchen. Only Stargirl was still chewing. Hillary moved around to the side. I'm Hillary Kimball, she said. Stargirl looked up. She smiled, she said. I know. My birthday is tomorrow. I know. Hillary paused, her eyes narrow. She jabbed a finger in Stargirl's face. Don't try singing to me. I'm warning you. Only those at nearby tables heard Stargirl's faint reply. I won't sing to you. Hillary gave a satisfied smirk and walked off. From the moment we arrived at school the next day, the atmosphere bristled like cactus paddles. When the buzzer sounded for first lunch, we leaped for the doors. We swarmed into the food lines. We raced through our choices and hurried to our seats. Never had we moved so fast, so quietly. At most, we whispered, we sat, we ate. We were afraid to crunch our potato chips, afraid we might miss something. Hillary was first to enter. She marched in, leading her girlfriends like an invading general. In the food line, she smacked items onto her tray. She glared at the cashier. While her friends scanned the crowd for Stargirl, Hillary stared ferociously at her sandwich. Wayne Parr came in and sat several tables away, as if even he was afraid of her on this day. Stargirl finally came in. She went straight to the food line, blithely smiling as usual. Both she and Hillary seemed unaware of each other. Stargirl ate. Hillary ate. We watched. Only the clock moved. A kitchen staffer stuck her head out over the conveyor belt and yelled, Trays! A voice barked back, Shut up! Stargirl finished her lunch. As usual, she stuffed her wrappings into her paper bag, carried the bag to the paper only, to the paper only can by the tray return window and dropped it in. She returned to her seat. She picked up her ukulele. We stopped breathing. Hillary stared at her sandwich. So everybody stopped breathing because they're waiting for what? They're waiting for Stargirl to sing. They're wondering, is she gonna sing to Hillary? Or is she just going to sing a song? Stargirl began strumming and humming. She stood. She strolled between the tables, humming, strumming. Three hundred pairs of eyes followed her. She came to Hillary Kimball's table and kept on walking right up to the table where Kevin and I sat with the hot seat crew. She stopped and she sang, Happy Birthday. It was Hillary's name at the end of the song. But true to her word the day before, she did not sing it to Hillary. She sang it to me. She stood at my shoulder and looked down at me, smiling and singing, and I don't know whether to look down at my hands or up at her face. So I did some of each. My face was burning. When she finished, the students burst from their silence with wild applause. Hillary Kimball stomped from the lunchroom. Kevin looked up at Stargirl and pointed at me and said what everyone must have been thinking. Why him? Stargirl tilted her head as if studying me. She grinned mischievously. She tugged my earlobe and said, he's cute, and walked off. I was feeling nine ways at once, and they all ended up at the touch of her hand on my ear, until Kevin reached over and yanked the same earlobe. This keeps getting more interesting, he said. I think it's time to go see Archie. Next chapter. Chapter 7. A.H. 
Archibald Hapwood Brubaker lived in a house of bones, jaw bones, hip bones, femurs. There were bones in every room, every closet, on the back porch. Some people have stone cats on their roofs. On his roof, Archie Brubaker had a skeleton of Monroe, his deceased Siamese. Take a seat in his bathroom and you find yourself facing the faintly smirking skull of Doris, a prehistoric creodont. I will be looking up that word later because I have never heard of a creodont. Open the kitchen cabinet where the peanut butter was kept and you were face to fossil face with an extinct fox. Archie was not morbid. He was a paleontologist. So if you don't know what morbid means, morbid means kind of like, likes death, talks about death, thinks about death. But it wasn't morbidity. It was paleontology, which is the study of skeletons, fossils. The bones were from digs he had done throughout the American West. Many were rightly his, found in his spare time. Others he collected from museums, but slipped into his own pocket or knapsack instead. Better to sit in my refrigerator than disappear in a drawer in some museum basement, he would say. When he wasn't digging up old bones, Archie Brubaker was teaching at universities in the East. He retired at the age of 65. When he was 65, his wife, Ada May, died. At 67, he moved himself and his bones west to join the other fossils. He chose his home for two reasons. One, its proximity to the high school. He wanted to be near kids. He had none of his own. And two, Senor Suaro. Senor Suaro was a cactus, a 30-foot tall giant that towered over the tool shed in the backyard. So in one of the other chapters, I told you that the Suaro cactuses were very, very, very tall. And so here, um, Mr. Archie has a 30 foot tall one. It had two arms high on the trunk. One stuck straight out. The other made a right turn upward as if waving adios. The waving arm was green from the elbow up. All else was brown, dead. Much of the thick leathery skin along the trunk had come loose and crumpled up in a heap about the massive foot. Senor Suaro had lost his pants. Only his ribs, thumb thick vertical timbers held him up. Elf owls nested in his chest. The old professor often talked to Senor Suaro and to us. He was not certified to teach in Arizona, but that did not stop him. Every Saturday morning, his house became a school. Fourth graders, twelfth grade graders, all were welcome. No tests, no grades, no attendance record. Just the best school most of us had ever gone to. He covered everything from toothpaste to tapeworms and somehow made it all fit together. He called us the loyal order of the stone bone. He gave us homemade necklaces. The pendant was a small fossil bone strung on rawhide. Years before, he had told his first class, call me Archie. He never had to say it again. After dinner that day, Kevin and I walked over to Archie's. Though the official class convened on Saturday, on Saturday morning, kids were welcome anytime. My school, he said, is everywhere and always in session. We found him, as usual, on the back porch, rocking and reading. The porch, bathed in the red gold light of sunset, faced the Maricopas. Archie's white hair seemed to give off a light of his own. The moment he saw us, he put down his book. Students, welcome! So is anybody wondering why they think they need to go see Archie after, um, after they're kind of curious about Stargirl singing to Leo? I am. And then when they said they were going to see Archie, when we read that Archie was older, in his 60s, I was wondering, well, why, why are they going to see a 60-year-old? So I'm still curious about Archie. Archie, we said, then turned to greet the great cactus as visitors were expected to do. Senor Saguaro, we saluted. We sat on rockets. The porch was full of them. So men, he said, business or pleasure? Bafflement, I said. There's a new girl in school. He laughed. Star girl? 
Kevin's eyes popped. You know her? Know her, he said. He picked up his pipe and loaded it with cherry sweet tobacco. He always did this when settling in for a long lecture or conversation. Good question, he lit the pipe. Let's say she's been on the porch here quite a few times. White smoke puffed like Apache signals from the corner of his mouth. I was wondering when you'd start asking questions, he chuckled to himself. Bafflement. Good word. She is different, isn't she? Kevin and I burst into laughter and nods. At that moment, I realized how much I had been craving Archie's confirmation. Kevin exclaimed, like another species. Archie, cook, um, Archie cocked his head as if he had just caught the sound of a rare bird. The pipe stem anchored a wry grin. A sweet scent filled the air about our rocking chairs. He stared at Kevin. On the contrary, she is one of us. Most decidedly, she is us more than we are us. She is, I think, who we really are or were. Archie talked that way sometimes in riddles. We didn't always know what he was saying, but our ears didn't much care. We just wanted to hear more. As the sun dipped below the mountains, it fired a final dart at Archie's flashing eyebrows. She's homeschooled, you know. Her mother brought her to me. I guess she wanted a break from playing teacher one day a week, four, five, yes, five years now. Kevin pointed. You created her? Archie smiled, puffed. No, that was done long before me. Some people are saying she's some kind of alien sent down here from Alpha Centauri or something, or Centauri. Um, I believe that that is a constellation. He chuckled, but not too convincingly. He half believed it. Archie's pipe had gone out. He relit it. She's anything but. She's an earthling if there ever was one. So it's not just an act, said Kevin. An act? No. If anybody's acting, it's us. She's as real as us. He looked around. He picked up the tiny wedge-like skull of Barney, a 60 million year old Paleocene rodent, and held it up. As real as Barney. I felt a little jolt of pride at having reached this conclusion myself. But the name, said Kevin, leaning forward, is it real? The name, Archie shrugged, every name is real. That's the, na that's the nature of names. When she first showed up, she called herself Pocket Mouse, then Mud Pie, then, uh, what? Hully Gully, I believe. Now, Star Girl. The word came out whispery. My throat was dry. Archie looked at me. Whatever strikes her fancy. Maybe that's how names ought to be, huh? Why be stuck with just one your whole life? What about her parents, said Kevin? What about them? What do they think? Archie shrugged. I guess they agree. What do they do, Kevin said. Breathe, eat, clip their toenails. Kevin laughed. You know what I mean. Where do they work? Mrs. Carraway, until a few months ago, was Stargirl's teacher. I understand she also makes costumes for movies. Kevin poked me. The crazy clothes! Her father, Charles, works. Where else? Micatronics, we said in chorus. I said it with wonder, for I had imagined something more exotic. Kevin said, so where is she from? A natural question in a city as young as Micah. Nearly everybody had been born somewhere else. Archie's eyebrows went up. Good question. He took a long pull on the pipe. Some would say Minnesota, but in her case, he let out the smoke, his face disappearing in a gray cloud. A sweet haze veiled sunset, cherries roasting in the maricopas. He whispered, Rara Avis. Archie, said Kevin, you're not making a lot of sense. Archie laughed. <laughs> Do I ever? Kevin jumped up. I want to put her on hot seat. Dorco Borlock here doesn't want to. Archie studied me through the smoke. I thought I saw approval, but when he spoke, he merely said, work it out, men. We talked until dark. We said adios to Senior Suaro on our way.
way out, Archie said more to me than to Kevin. I thought, you'll know her more by, you'll know her more by your questions than you by her answers. Keep looking at her long enough. One day, you might see someone you know. And then we're at chapter eight. So, one of the things that struck me as I was reading, and I hope I can find it real quick, was um, the white, pof white smoke puffed like Apache signals from the corner of his mouth. So that's some really good imagery that I get from what he was, you know, the pipe that he was smoking. And um, if you don't know what Apache signals are, Google that up, um, smoke signals. So be thinking about how Archie might kind of pull everybody together um, and what he means by that last sentence when it said, you'll know her more by your questions than by her answers. Keep looking at her long enough. One day you might see someone you know. Hmm. So do you think that she's from another planet out of this world? Or do you think she's just kind of a really interesting person that these people need in their lives? See you next time.